Well, welcome back, everybody, as we uh, begin our studies in the Torah, even though we're starting the, near the middle of the Torah cycle. Um, for me, it's a, it's a new start. Uh, last week, if you were with us, we finished our studies in 2 Corinthians, and I told you then that uh, in this last year, I'm going to be with Beth Takum before I retire. Uh, we're going to just jump right into the Torah cycle. And so we're in the book of Numbers, chapter 19. The Torah portion is Kuchat. And we're just going to go right on around. And then this time next year, we will have completed the cycle. So I know it's a bit of an odd way to do it, but whoever said we have to be normal, right? So uh, let's just get right into our study. Kuchat begins in the book of Numbers, chapter 19. And the reason this is called Chukat is because in verse 2 it says, Zot Chukat HaTorah, this is the decree, the statute of the Torah. Chukat is a type of law that makes no common sense. It's not a kind of law you would ever arrive at using human reasoning and logic. It just isn't logical, but it worked. And there are several Chukats or Chukat team. In, uh, in the Torah, and they're just not logical laws. And it begins with this, and it's probably one of the most odd statutes God has ever given. It's the statute about the red heifer. And if we begin reading, it says, um, this is the decree of the Torah in verse 2, which Adonai has commanded, saying, speak to the children of Israel, and they shall take to you a completely red cow, a Para aduma, a red cow, a red heifer, which is without blemish, and upon which a yoke has not come. You shall give it to Eleazar the Kohen. He's the uh, the deputy high priest at this point. He shall take it to the outside of the camp, and someone shall slaughter it in his presence. Eleazar the Kohen shall take some of its blood with his forefinger, and sprinkle some of its blood toward the tent of meeting seven times. Someone shall burn the cow before his eyes. Its hide and its flesh and its blood with its dung shall he burn. The Kohen shall take cedar wood, hyssop, and crimson thread. He shall throw it them into the burning of the cow. Now this is where things get really weird. Now the reason that we're burning this cow is so we can take the ashes and we can sprinkle them, mix with living water, sprinkle them on someone who's ritually impure and it makes them ritually pure. So this is what makes it strange. It says in verse 6, the Kohen, or I'm sorry, verse 7, the Kohen shall immerse his clothing and immerse himself in water, and afterwards he may enter the camp. And the Kohen shall remain contaminated until evening. So let's make sure we get this straight. The ashes of this red heifer will be mixed with water, and they'll be used to sprinkle people who are ritually unclean and make them clean. But the priest who burns the red heifers, by, I'm sorry, who, who slaughters the red heifer, is made contaminated. He's made unclean by his slaughtering of this red heifer. But it gets weirder. In the next verse, verse 8, it says, The one who burns it shall immerse his clothing and immerse himself in water. And he shall remain contaminated until evening. So the one who slaughters the red cow becomes contaminated. The one who burns the red cow becomes contaminated. And then verse 9, a pure man shall gather the ash of the cow and place it outside the camp in a pure place. For the assembly of Israel shall remain as a safekeeping. For water of sprinkling it is for purification. The one who gathered the ash of the cow shall immerse his clothing and remain contaminated until the evening. So the one who slaughters, the one who burns the body of the cow, the one who collects the ashes, they all become impure through their actions. And we're not done yet. You go on over to verse 21. It says, This shall be for them an eternal decree. And the one who sprinkles the water of sprinkling shall immerse his clothing. And one who touches water sprinkling shall be contaminated until evening. So even the one who sprinkles this water or touches this water that purifies becomes contaminated. Another thing, it seems kind of odd. I don't know if you've ever gotten 
charcoal or, or ash from a fire on you, but it smears around and it's, it's, it just, it's a mess. How can ashes make a person pure? So this is why this chukat makes no logical sense. Solomon, uh, there's a, a, a legend that Solomon himself was totally stumped by this. And uh, he could figure out almost anything, but he says this one, I, can make, I cannot make heads or tails out of it. Now, if you've listened to past uh, studies where I've gone over this Torah portion, I talk about how the red heifer is actually a picture of Yeshua. I'm not going to go over that this time, though. You can go back and you can read some really great books on that. You can listen to past teachings and, and uh, we'll bring out those, those parallels. And there are many parallels there. But when you get to the end of chapter 19, this is very important. You should mark this in your Bibles. When you get to the end of chapter 19, at verse 22, it says, Anything that the contaminated one may, contaminated one may touch shall become contaminated and the person who touches him shall become contaminated until evening. And right there, at the end of this chapter, you can put a little comment in there and say, let the dying begin. Because between the end of chapter 19 and the beginning of chapter 20, about 38 years pass. And what's happening during those 38 years? There's a lot of dying going on. Just a few chapters previously, Moses sent some spies into the Promised Land. They, uh, they were right there on the Jordan River. They sent a spy from each of the tribes. They go across. Uh, Joshua and Caleb are two of the spies. They're there for 40 days. When they come back, they bring uh, huge clusters of grapes. They bring pomegranates. They say the land is lush and green and fruitful and wonderful. But there are giants there, there are walled cities, we were like grasshoppers compared to the people who live there. We can't take it. If this, is, this is a write-off. We can't do it. And they whipped the population into a frenzy and into, into hysteria. And um, it got so ugly that finally God stepped in and said, okay, you sent these spies over there, they were there for 40 days, and you don't have the courage and the faith in me to keep my promise, to bring you into the land of promise? Okay, then you won't go in. And your children that you're so fearful about, they will go in. And since you spent 40 days in the land, you're going to spend 40 years in the wilderness. And your only job is to die. Everyone over 20 years of age will die here. Those 20 and younger will grow up, and in 40 years, the next generation will go in. Now, they'd already been in the wilderness for a little over a year, and um, once they get to the Jordan River, there's going to be a little bit more going on. Uh, but roughly 38 years pass between the end of 19 and 20. Do you understand why this law about the red heifer is given where it is? There's nothing more contaminating in Hebraic thought than a human corpse. And it talks here about even if you're in a house under the same roof with a human corpse, it makes you unclean. There's going to be a lot of uncleanness over the next 38 years. In fact, we don't know the exact numbers of adults, but uh, the Torah tells us there were over 600,000 men who came out of Egypt. And uh, they probably would all have had wives and probably children, but we can figure as far as adults, they were probably well over a million, maybe a million, 200,000 adults. And when you do the calculations, there would be about a thousand funerals a day over those 38 years, roughly a thousand, give or take. Imagine that. Every day, there's another thousand bodies to bury. That means at least a thousand people became unclean. And if there's a whole family in a house, they wake up in the morning and, and one of the adults has passed away, everybody in that family has become unclean, ritually impure. So right before these 38 years of dying begin, God gives this kukhat, this statute, 
so that they will have a way of purifying themselves from all the death that will be surrounding them. So what I want to do in this Torah portion, even though there are about 11 stories here, there's a lot going on here, there is pretty much a common theme that goes through. And we'll get to that common theme near the end of the teaching. But what I want us to do is think about what is the purpose of the wilderness? We always talk about the 40 years in the wilderness. Then Yeshua spent 40 days in the wilderness. Moses had already spent 40 years in the wilderness after he fled from Egypt. And now he's going to spend another 40 years in the wilderness. And near the end of our portion, he gets angry at the younger generation, thinking they're going to make the same mistake as their parents, and he's afraid he's going to spend a third 40 years in the wilderness, and he gets pretty ticked about that. But what is the purpose of the wilderness? What is it? And there are two things I want you to keep in mind as we go through this teaching, as we go through the rest of the Torah. Here's the first one. Everyone must go to the wilderness. That includes you and me. That doesn't mean we go to the desert out in the Middle East. But we all have our own desert. We have our own place we go to before we can enter the land of promise, enter the fruitful life God has for us. You know, if you look at a map of Israel, you can go from Egypt and step right over the border, right into Israel. But that's not the way God ordained for them to go in. He led them east and up through Moab and through that area of the wilderness, and then later he had them cross from east to west. So instead of going from south to north into Egypt, he had them go around so they'd go from east to west into the land of promise, into Canaan. Um, and the most direct way is not the way God always has us go, because this is a spiritual journey he has us on, not a geographical one. And so you and I all have to go through the wilderness, and it's not pleasant. It's not fun. It's not meant to be, but it is meaningful. You know, there are two things in the Torah that are called great and awesome. Gadol v'hanorah, great and awesome. God is one, and the other thing is called great and awesome is the wilderness. And there's a, a definite purpose for this because it's in the wilderness you will get to know this God who has redeemed you from Egypt. When we come to the Lord, when we first give our lives to Him, we really don't know Him very well. In fact, most people when they get married really don't know their spouse that well. And, um, and over the years of marriage is when you really get to know this person you're in covenant with and grow to love them more. That's the way it should be. But when we first come to the Lord, we really don't know Him. And he takes us into the wilderness. And that's where we get to know him. It's also where some things in our lives have to die. They have to be buried. And it's where other things in our lives begin to grow. Because I, though there were a thousand funerals every day in the wilderness, there were also about a thousand births every day in the wilderness. The old has to die and be buried and then the new grows up to take its place. You can think of the wilderness as adolescence. Coming out of Egypt into the wilderness is like a birth. There were birth pains in the form of the plagues in Egypt. They came through the Red Sea, that's like being birthed. They come out of this place of restriction, Mitzrayim, Egypt means constriction. And they come out of a place of darkness into light, of slavery and confinement and into freedom. And so they enter this place now where they're very immature, but they need to grow. And um, when people talk about growing pains, it's not just a figure of speech. There is pain in growing, but it's worth it. And so in the wilderness is where the people are supposed to grow. But some things have to die. The childishness has to die. Not childlikeness, but childishness. The immaturity. It has to die, as like Paul says there at the end of 1 Corinthians 13. When I became a man, 
I put away childish things. And that's part of the purpose for the wilderness. Because only those who are mature and courageous and brave, those who are faithful, those who put their trust in God, are allowed to come into Canaan, are allowed to cross the Jordan, come to a place of fruitfulness and a place of warfare, a place of victory. And the land of Israel will only permit a nation to stay there if they're a righteous nation. And as we know, Israel did not remain a righteous nation, and so the land spewed them out, and they went into an exile in Babylon for 70 years. Then they came back in under Nehemiah and Ezra, a righteous people. But over time, they let their righteousness slip. They went back into to sin. And so under the Romans, they were exiled again. And that's the exile that's going on to this day. But we live in a generation where the Jews are coming back to Israel. And maybe the third time will prove to be the charm. And uh, this time they'll stay and we will join them there as Messiah returns. So the first thing you must realize from this lesson is everyone, you and me included, must go to the wilderness. And this is extremely important to remember. Number two, the only way out of the wilderness is through the wilderness. All the time, the uh, Jewish people were saying, we want to go back to Egypt, but they weren't allowed. They couldn't. There was a barrier. There, there was a Red Sea. God was not going to part it for them to go back. It was a one-way trip. And they were either going to die in the wilderness or go through the wilderness, but that's the only way to come out of the wilderness. You have to go through it. It's a place of testing. And we know in Corinthians it says, no testing has over, overtaken you, but such is the common of man. But God is faithful who will, with the testing, provide a way through. And Paul may very well have been thinking about the wilderness experience when he wrote those words. So, I want us to get a thorough understanding, as thorough as we can, of what the wilderness is. And so we're going to begin with a Hebrew word. There it is. This is the word devar. Devar. It means word or speak. The book of Deuteronomy is called Devarim, which is the plural of Devar, because the book of Deuteronomy begins, these are the words, Elah Devarim. And uh, so Devar means word or to speak. Now, the middle letter of this word is the letter bait. It is the second letter of the alphabet and has a numerical value of two. In fact, the letter bait kind of looks like a two. The first letter of the word is the letter dalet. It's the fourth letter of the alphabet and it has a value of four or we could say two squared, two times two. And the last letter of the, alpha, of, of the word is near the end of the alphabet. It's the 20th letter of the alphabet. It has a value of 200. So we could say 2 times 10 squared, 2 times 100. You see a lot of 2's going on here. We see the first letter is 2 times 2, the second letter equals 2, and is the second letter of the alphabet. The last letter is the 20th letter of the alphabet with a value of 200. And in fact, that middle letter, the one that's at the heart of this word, happens to be the first letter of the Bible. I'll put Torah here, because the Torah is the, is the beginning of the Bible. But the very first verse of Genesis begins, Bereshit bara Elohim, in the beginning God created. And the first letter of that first word, Bereshit, is this letter. Now the reason I'm putting these things here is because there's a message that's coming through. You see a lot of twos here. Two speaks of duality. And the rabbis from, from the beginning have always talked about how the Word of God, how the Torah, the entire Word of God, there's a duality to it. There's a two-ness to it. Everything comes in twos. 
And you have often heard me refer to how the scriptures are like a menorah. And what's a menorah? It's a set of twos. You've got a middle stalk, but for every branch off this side, you have a balancing branch, a second branch coming from the other side that keeps it balanced. And that is how a menorah works. You have a branch this side, you better have a balancing one this side so it stands upright. And the Word of God is like that. So I want you to keep this in mind, the duality of Scripture. And we see that duality, all these twos, woven through the Hebrew word for word. There's a, a real, really serious problem that we can get into if we do not engage the duality of Scripture. If we become very one-sided in how we engage the Word of God. And uh, as we go through these characteristics of the Scripture's duality, you can probably think of things maybe in your own life. I'm really hoping you apply this to your own life and look for where you are out of balance in your relationship with God's Word. So let's go through these. And uh, I, I know you'll think of other people and, and maybe teachers that you've encountered who are out of balance. But uh, the structure of the Bible itself, we have... The first part of the Bible, which is the Hebrew Scriptures, or as it's most familiarly, uh, familiarly referred to as the Old Testament. I don't like that term, but just for brevity, I'm going to use it here. So we have the Hebrew Scriptures, but the other part of the Bible is the New Testament Scriptures, which are the Greek Scriptures or Apostolic Scriptures. So even in how the Scriptures are themselves, you have Yeshua coming in the middle, but you've got the Hebrew Scriptures coming before Him, and then the Apostolic Greek Scriptures coming after Him. So you have like this menorah centered around Yeshua Himself. Because everything in the Hebrew Scriptures point to Him, everything in the Greek Scriptures point back to Him. And um, it, it's a, a beautiful pattern when you uh, take time to look at how everything moves together towards Yeshua. In Hebrews, in Hebrews 4.12, it says the Word of God is living and sharper than what? Any one-edged sword? No. Sharper than any two-edged sword. Machaira is the Greek word. Two-edged sword. What's interesting is that in Hebrew, I don't know about Greek, but in Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew word for an edge, a blade, is satha, which is a lip. You could say it, a two-lipped sword which is another allusion to the mouth. In fact, in Revelation, Yeshua is uh, described as returning to earth on a horse and a two-edged sword is pro, uh, pro, protruding from his mouth. It's a spiritual picture. I don't think it's a, supposed to be taken literally. Um, but it's a two-edged sword. It refers to balance. And of course, the point of that sword is Messiah. Now, this is where it gets down to some very practical things about how we study the Word of God. There are two things you are to learn from the Word. And you can only learn one of these to the degree you learn the other. And here are the two things. You're going to learn about yourself. Because the Scriptures are a mirror, as James says. He talks about someone who looks into the Torah and sees his reflection. When you look into the Torah, when you look into the Word of God, you should see you. You should see you as you should appear, and you should see yourself as you do appear, and then begin to make the proper changes. But you also encounter God. You know, some people, and God's given them a gift for this, they can look into the Word and see all kinds of practical lessons about how to live life, how to be wise, how to use sound principles to make wise decisions, how to uh, have a good marriage, how to handle money and raise children and be a successful businessman and an honest businessman. They see practical applications everywhere. It's wonderful. God bless them. And I'm not taken away from that. But it's also important alongside those practical applications just to see God Himself. 
just to look into the light of his face and begin to see him to a degree where you sense awe and love and devotion to him, just to see him, just to know him. On the other hand, some people go to the scriptures just to learn about God, but they don't put anything into practice. So we want to have these in practice. We want to be people who know God and live like we know God, not just one or the other. The Jewish people, the rabbis, all often refer to an outer dimension of the word and an inner dimension. An outer and an inner. I think the word itself demonstrates this and illustrates this, this duality here best in the way it uses the terms scriptures, you see the word scriptures in the scriptures, and then you see the word, the word in the scriptures. And whenever the Bible uses these two terms, it uses them very precisely. And you've heard me talk about this before if you've been uh, listening at all for any period of time, but it's worth repeating. This is a Bible. It's physical. It is paper with ink printed on it. And um, anything that can happen to any other physical object can happen to this physical object. And this object can be damaged, it can be protected, it can be burned, it can be thrown in the water, it can, it'll wear out eventually someday. It's a physical object and nothing more. Well, it is something more because it has words in it that have been copied for centuries, over centuries, and these, these words, this printed word, this book, expresses God's message. But the word itself is utterly spiritual. The word is something that is non-physical. It's something eternal. And when you think about how these two terms are used, it makes a difference in what the message is. Um, for example, we quoted Hebrews 4.12. It says, For the, uh, the word of God is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. It doesn't say the scriptures are. But the word is. The word is alive. The scriptures are dead. They're paper. They were part of a tree at one time that was alive, but it's not alive anymore. The scriptures are physical. They're not alive. The Torah scroll, there's one right behind the camera, uh, written on sheepskin. That sheep was once alive, it's dead now. And that Torah scroll is a dead thing. But the message it contains is alive. The message it contains is living and life-changing. And it's sharp. It can pierce to the dividing of the soul and the spirit. The scriptures can't do that. But the message they contain, that spiritual message, it can do that to us. It can change us and alter us for eternity. And it needs to change us. We need to be changed by it. Um, the, the Bible doesn't say the scriptures became flesh and dwelt among us. It says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So make sure you understand this. One is the outer dimension. One is the inner dimension. You have to have the outer dimension, which is the container it's the vessel so you can tap into the inner dimension. An illustration I like to use is that of a window. You know, we have walls around this room, and light does not come through those walls. But where there's a window, where there's glass there, the light can come through. The scriptures are like that window. But the Word of God is like the light that comes through that window. Without the window, I couldn't see the light. And without the scriptures, I couldn't know the word. But just having glass there doesn't mean there's any light coming through. And so when you engage the scriptures, yes, they are fascinating. Yes, there's so much to occupy your mind. You can memorize them. You can study theology and Bible geography. And you can study the, the original languages and never connect with the word of God. 
And I think it's a very sad thing when people engage with the scriptures, but they never encounter the word. It's like someone has a piece of glass, but no light ever comes through. We need the scriptures because they are the vessel by which the light can come through to our lives. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, then ask God to reveal that to you. And if you haven't encountered the light of the living God coming through the scriptures, then ask him to reveal himself to you. And one of the things you can do to help this to happen is to slow down. Slow down. Don't be in a rush. You know, previously in the Torah, it talked about the people going out to gather manna. And it says the people who gathered a lot didn't have any left over, and the people who gathered a little, they had plenty. It's almost as if how much you gather doesn't even matter because you're going to get full either way. And uh, there's going to be enough, so don't worry about it. But I'd say slow down, meditate, chew on the word, think about it. Turn the radio off, radio off when you're driving and think about what you've read. Memorize a verse and chew on it and allow God to speak to you through that. And then allow Him to direct you to other passages that help confirm what you're, you're thinking, what you're learning, and begin to enhance what you're learning and make it grow. I could talk about this all night, but we need to move on. But I hope you'll really seriously ponder uh, the Word and the Scriptures and make sure that as you study the Scriptures, you're encountering the Word of God, the living Word. You know, the, uh, the sages have a, a fascinating way of describing this phenomena. They talk about black fire on white fire. When you look at a Torah scroll or a page in the Bible, the paper is white and the print is black. And we focus on the print, don't we? We focus on the letters. But the sages say, is black fire on white fire. In other words, even the white space around and in between the letters is fire. It's something that's alive. Now this is really a deep thought. It takes some, some thinking. But uh, they're saying even what the scriptures do not say is something God wants to speak to us about. Even what is not spoken in the scriptures God can speak between the letters to you. It's a fascinating thought, but it's just something for you to think about. But um, speaking of, of fire, God's word is called fire, but it's also called water. And as you know, whenever you have, find fire and water dwelling together in peace and harmony, God is there. A passage you can look up is Jeremiah 23, 29. And it says this. Is not my word like fire, declares Adonai, and like a hammer which shatters a rock? So we see the destructive force of God's word. It's like fire, and it's like a, a, a rock, a hammer that smashes a rock. But when you go over to Ephesians, Ephesians 5.26, look what it says. We'll start with verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, just as Messiah also loved the community and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her. Now get this. Having cleansed her by the washing of water by the word. So here we see the word of God like water. It's also like fire. The Word of God can come in like fire and burn us. It can come in like a hammer and break us. There are parts of us that need to be destroyed. There are parts of us that need to be burned up and cleared away and be broken. But also, our Lord will come in and with the Word, it'll be like soothing water to bring comfort and cleansing. And the Word of God can do both. Which kind of reminds me of the red heifer. What did they do with the red heifer? 
they burned it completely to ash. That was the act of fire. But then we're told those ashes had to be mixed with what? With living water. When they're mixed together, they bring cleansing. They bring purity. Now, why am I talking about the word devar so much? What does that have to do with the wilderness? Well, if you come down here to this next word, you'll see our word devar right there. Dalit, bait, resh. There it is, devar. But when we add this letter mem into the front, the word becomes wilderness. That's the word that we see all through the Torah. In fact, the book of Numbers is called the Bamidbar in the wilderness. So in the wilderness, in the Midbar, is where God reveals his Devar. After all, where did God give the Torah? Did he give it while they were in Egypt? Did he give the Israelites the Torah when they were in the land of Canaan? No. In the Midbar, he gave his Devar. And it's in the wilderness that we truly begin to encounter God's work. We get to know what it is. But now let's ask a more fundamental question. What's God's Word supposed to accomplish in us? What's the purpose of knowing His Word? Is it just so we can be a little more cautious in the way we live? Is it so we can educate ourselves and others? Uh, is it so we can convince people that our God is superior to theirs? Well, all these things are part of it, but there's something much more profound. And I know in my own life and in the lives of others, they use the Word of God for all these things I mentioned, but they never allow the Word of God to do this one thing that is the most important thing, its most important purpose. And the Word of God is supposed to accomplish in us what the wilderness accomplished with the Israelites. I wish we could put the entire chapter Deuteronomy 8 up here, but I'm just going to take the first six verses, but I encourage you after the teaching to, to look at the whole chapter. In fact, to read the whole first eight chapters of Deuteronomy because this happens near maybe the last day or next to the last day of Moses' life. And he's standing on the shores of the Jordan River. Jericho is right across the way. And Moses is just pouring out. He's 120 years old, pouring out his soul to this new generation just trying to drive home and remind them of all the lessons that God had taught their parents or tried to teach them and, and taught them, giving them their history once again and encouraging them about going forth because they'd come to the place where the wilderness had done its job. And now it's time to go to the goal, go across the Jordan, begin to live a life of victory and fruitfulness over there. But anyways, I'm preaching. Let's get to these six verses. And just take a look. Moses says, All the commandments that I am commanding you today you shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which Adonai swore to give to your forefathers. And again, as I said earlier, only a people who are keeping God's commandments and living in covenant relationship with God can truly occupy the land of Israel. And only people who are truly living in covenant relationship with God can live the kind of life that the Torah is trying to describe to us, a life that is fruitful and victorious. And he goes on and says, And you shall remember all the way all the way, which Adonai your God has led you in the midbar, in the wilderness, these 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart. This is part of the wilderness. The wilderness will reveal what is in your heart. There are no secrets in the wilderness. Whatever's on the inside comes to the outside. Whether you would keep his commandments or not, and he humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of Adonai. That's our new diet. 
Your clothing did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these forty years. Thus you are to know in your heart that Adonai your God was disciplining you just as a man disciplines his son. Why does a man discipline his son? So the son becomes a man. So the the son will put away the childish things. And, uh, you know, just this last weekend, Steve Meeks took uh, a lot of the, the young dads, there might have been some older ones too, but took a lot of young dads out for a, a dad event. They, they backpacked out on Friday, spent all Shabbat at the campsite, and then backpacked back to the cars on, on Sunday. And while they're out there, he was training them how to raise their boys to be men. He took them out onto an experience where they could begin to learn the tools necessary to help their sons cross over into manhood. Because though in my experience, little girls grow up knowing how to be feminine, knowing how to be little girls and how to be women. They just want to pretend they're moms and wives and, uh, and just femininity just comes naturally to them. Masculinity, not so much for boys. In all cultures around the world, there is some rite of manhood where when a boy reaches puberty, around 12, 13, right in there, the men in that culture will take the boys and um, there'll be some rite of passage. And the, the little boy goes off with the men and he goes off a little boy, he comes back a man. And um, it's, this is a common experience all over the world. But in the West, in modern times, it's been lost. And so we have a lot of men who are physically men, but they're still little boys. They don't know how to be husbands. They only know how to be sons. And they're not looking for wives, they're looking for moms. And uh, it's a very strange and troubling phenomena that we have so few boys growing up to truly become men, healthy, respectable, honorable men who know their duty and do it. And uh, so as believers, we need to become the men God wants us to be so we can help our sons become the men God wants them to be as well. But the whole purpose of the wilderness was for boys to become men. And then it closes, the sixth verse, Therefore you shall keep, his command, keep the commandments of Adonai your God to walk in His ways and to fear Him. I just wanted to give you this sampling. And I circled words that have to do with knowing, remembering, understanding, the heart. And I mentioned last week as we finished 2 Corinthians, the Bible makes very little distinction between emotion and intellect. And often when the Bible uses the term heart, it's really for, referring to the thoughts and the mind as well. It's kind of all one package. So I circled the heart here. And this brings us to something that, that will help us make sense of why this portion about the, gold, not the golden calf, but the red heifer is here. What it has to do with this wilderness experience and all this death? So I should have put this in the notes, but it's something kind of formulated kind of late into the day. It didn't make it into the notes, but you can picture this. The reason Israel did not make it into the promised land, the reason that, that the original generation didn't make it in, was because of their own human reasoning. When they sent the spies over, ten of those spies came back with a a negative report because their logic told them those people are big, we are small. They have walled cities. What do we have? Spears and swords. And um, we just can't do it. There's too many of them. We just can't do it. We've made the calculations. We've run it through the computer. And the readout is we can't do it. Human reasoning is why they failed. And I said for years, the greatest enemy of faith is human reasoning. You know, when you look at the scriptures, every order God gives for, for moving, for doing something for Him, 
for making progress, every order he gives never makes sense. Never. Not a single time. I mean, for Pete's sake, think of, think of Gideon. Here's a guy who's not even a warrior. God calls him a mighty man of God. Well, that doesn't make sense. And then he says, you need to go out and you need to fight. I believe it was, uh, was it the Ammonites? I forget. This is just, I'm, I'm scraping the back of my mind trying to remember the details. But uh, he tells him to get together a bunch of men. So he gets, uh, I don't know, I think it's something like uh, 50,000, 20, 30, 40,000 men. And God says, that's too many. You need to weed them out. And then it goes down to about 12,000 men. God says, ah, that's still too many for me to use. And then God weeds them down to 300 men. And this is the book of Judges, around chapter 6, if I'm not mistaken. I could be very mistaken, because again, I, this is something I had, didn't rehearse. So Gideon takes 300 men. Now, they don't even have swords in their hands. They've got a, a shofar in one hand, and then they've got a torch with a, a clay pitcher over it in the other. And I don't know how you're supposed to fight with those. But then they go against this encampment that has well over 100 thousand men in it. A hundred thousand. He has three hundred. That does not make sense. It's illogical. It can't work. But it did. Yeshua, he's at a wedding. They ran out of wine. Must have been a lot of people there to run out of wine. And so his mother tells the servants, do whatever he tells you. So there's six water pots there for purification. They're empty. Must have been a lot of people there. And he tells them, fill those water pots with water. That doesn't make sense. But he says, get a ladle full, take it up to the master of the feast. Well, this isn't going to work. They need wine, not water. It makes no sense. Human reasoning tells you this is foolishness. But when he tastes the water, it's not water anymore. It's wine. When God had Moses lead the people of Israel out of Egypt, instead of just leading them north right into Canaan, he takes them around and, and it looks like they're entangled in the land. And they get to a point where the Red Sea is on one side and here comes Pharaoh's cavalry with all of its chariots on the other. And they start whining and complaining because the common sense says we're dead men. We have a choice. Choice A, drown. Choice B, get hacked to death by the charioteers. This is ridiculous. Weren't there enough graves in Egypt that you'd bring us out here for us to die to be buried? It made no sense. To them, God was a horrible tactician. He was not a good general. But God had a plan. He parts the Red Sea. The people go across on dry land, and then when the charioteers come across, the sea closes up and drowns them. End of, end, end of the war. And if you look at the scriptures from beginning to end, whenever God gives direction for a people to go, it never makes sense. So again, all of this to say, human reasoning is the reason that first generation died. So human reasoning led to death. And what's the most impure thing a person can touch? A human corpse. So all these dead bodies, thousand or so a day, led to terrible impurity. What's the solution? Something that's utterly foolish. <laughs> you take a, a red cow, and one of the priests takes the cow out and slaughters it, and he becomes impure because of that. Another priest burns it, which makes him impure. Another priest gathers the ashes, which makes him impure. Another priest mixes it with water and sprinkles it, which makes him impure. But all the people that this water falls on become pure. In other words, human reasoning led to death, which led to impurity. So God uses something that's totally contradictory to human reasoning to restore purity to these people. You begin to see how this fits together. In the wilderness, this is the purpose of the wilderness. I hope you remember this. If you don't remember anything else, remember this. Question, 
What is the purpose of the wilderness? Answer, it is where God takes us to change our minds. Now, I don't mean change our mind the way you, <laughs> the way the Israelites did. Oh, we're getting out of Egypt. And then they, they start getting thirsty and then they say, change my mind. I want to go back. That's what I mean by change my mind. It doesn't mean um, you, you ordered something on the menu and it came and they decided to change your mind. I'm talking about a change of the mind, not a change of opinion or a change of a decision, but a fundamental change of the human mind itself. That is what the wilderness is for. That's why God takes the long route from Egypt to Canaan. He takes them on this long detour through the wilderness because their minds are not ready to occupy the land of Israel. They were not ready to be a righteous people who could live in a place of victory and fruitfulness. Their minds had to be completely altered. Their minds were the minds of slaves who were used to obeying the commandments of Pharaoh. But now they are the beloved bondservants of the creator of the universe, the one who is Abraham's friend, the covenant God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who promised hundreds of years ago that I'll bring these children into the promised land. And that's why it's the promised land. He promised to bring Abraham's children into it. But he had to prepare them. They had to become like Abraham before they could go in. And Abraham didn't live by human reasoning. Think about it for a moment. There he is, living in the land of Ur. He's married, his family's there, his home is there, he's, everything's familiar. And one day God says, Abraham, I want you to leave this land, I want you to leave your family, leave it all, and, and go with me to a land that I'm going to show you. Would any reasonable person do such a thing? Wouldn't a, a reasonable, logical person say, well, with all due respect, whatever God you are, um, can you give me a little more information? Uh, what is this land you're talking about us going to, and what's wrong with this land? Can I just stay here and change this land into a better one? Um, what's this all about? Abram didn't ask those questions. He didn't live by human reasoning. Something in his heart burned because he knew this was God. And God was to be trusted and obeyed. And he's the one person in the Bible God calls his friend. I want to be God's friend. I'm not a very good friend to him most of the time. But I'd like to be. If I'm going to be his friend, I have to have a, a renewed mind. And that's the purpose of the wilderness. A renewed mind mind. So I don't think and reason according to the ways of the world, according to human reasoning. But I obey a God whose thoughts are higher than my thoughts, whose ways are completely different from my ways. And I have to trust that His ways are better. And in due time, maybe I'll understand Him, but I know one thing's for sure, if I don't follow Him, I'm going to be miserable. And um, I want the wilderness to have its effect in me. I want to become the man he wants me to be. Because I can't think of any other kind of man worth being. So I'm going to do my best. I, I fail an awful lot, but I'm determined. I want us to look at an interesting um, factoid here. In the book of Numbers, back in chapter 1, there was a census. And in that census, you can read it, it's in verse 46, the total of all the 12 tribes was 603,550 men. Then when you get to the end, or near the end of the book of Numbers, in chapter 26, after the 38 years of 1,000 or more people dying every day, there's a new census taken, and in this census, there are 601,730 men. You'll find that in chapter 26, verse 51. So that means 
that by the end of the book of Numbers, there are 1,820 fewer men than there were at the beginning. This sounds like a loss, doesn't it? It's definitely fewer men. 1,820 to be exact. But I want us to consider this number, 1,820. It's a number we find hidden in Scripture in a number of places. And it always has some fascinating dimension to it. Because you see, 1,820 is the number of God's name, which is 26 multiplied by 70. Seven is the number of perfection. Whenever you add zeros onto a number, it means it's intensifying that number's quality, that number's character. So if seven is perfect, 70 is ultimate perfection. So there might have been 1,820 fewer men, but these men have been brought to a place of perfection. And in Hebraic thought, uh, the word perfect, salim, um, shalem, it means not just perfect, it means mature. Because perfection is more than just a flawlessness. It means there's a maturity, a full stature. And these people were mature in what? They are mature in their knowledge of God. Fewer men. It looked like less. But these men were more. So just something interesting to ponder. I want us to skip over to Numbers chapter 20. I know our time is running out. We still have a ways to go. So I was going to read these 12 verses, but... You can read them. This is the story of when Miriam died, the rock that had been giving water all this time quit giving water. And so the people, this new generation, begin to whine and complain to Moses. And he's thinking, oh no, here we go again. And so it says that uh, in verse 6, Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the congregation to the entrance of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces. The glory of Adonai appeared to them. Verse 7, Adonai spoke to Moses saying, Take the staff and gather together the assembly, you and Aaron, your brother, and speak to the rock before their eyes that it shall give its waters. Now, 40 years earlier, God had told Moses to strike the rock with his staff. This time he tells him to speak to it. And then it says, you shall bring forth for them water from the rock and give drink to the assembly and to their animals. Moses took the staff from before Adonai as he had been commanded. Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation before the rock, and he said to them, Listen now, O rebel, shall we bring forth water for you from this rock? And Moses raised his arm and struck the rock with his staff twice. Abundant water came forth, and the assembly and their animals drank. Adonai said to Moses to Aaron, Because you, and it's plural, because you too did not believe in me to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore you, plural again, will not bring this congregation to the land that I have given them. They are the waters of strife, Meribah is the the word, where the children of Israel contended with Adonai and he was sanctified through them. And so Moses and Aaron do not get to enter the promised land. This has always been kind of a mysterious passage. People ask the question, why did God command Moses to take his staff if he didn't want him to use it against the rock? I think the answer to that is is so that the people could see that though Moses had a staff, he knew how not to use it. And God gives us abilities and strengths, and we need to know how to use them. But we need to know how not to use them when we shouldn't. And um, as I read this this week, I I've felt convicted, and I shared with Rob, and I want to share with you. you know, over the 25 years that I've been teaching at Beth de Coon, there were times that. I was tempted to be angry because of something going on in the congregation or because I felt that uh, 
Some people needed the chewing out, and I always tried very hard not to do that. I don't think the, the teacher's chair should ever be used as a whipping post, and I've tried not to do that. But I know time, there are times that, though maybe I wasn't striking the rock, in my heart I was. Many times in my heart I'm a, I'm a rock slapper. And so I just want to, before you, to ask your forgiveness. For times I've taught publicly or even shared with you in privately, but especially publicly, any time that I've said something that was hurtful, I've never named names up here, but sometimes there can be an attitude. And I want to ask, ask you just to forgive me for that because I look at what Moses did and I think, Grant, you've done things much more much more severe than that. Because he hit a rock, and in my heart I've hit people with my words. And I am determined never to do that again. So in this next year, I want you to hold me accountable. And if I have caused pain to you through words I've said, uh, I'm just going to ask your forgiveness. There's no excuse for it. And uh, I don't think it happened often. I've tried to be very careful, but you know, when you do as much talking as I do in front of people, you're bound to make mistakes. Where there's a lot of words, there's going to be, there's going to be error, and I know that I'm no exception to that rule. But uh, I do know this, that even in Moses' error, it says that because the sons of Israel contended with Adonai, and he was sanctified through them, and he was sanctified through them, even though it's six words in English, it's only two words in Hebrew. bum. There's that word kadash or kadosh, which means holy. And he was sanctified, he was made holy. And this word bum means through them. But nobody knows what the them is. Is the them referring to the waters? God was sanctified through the waters? Is the them referring to the sons of Israel? Or is the them referring to Moses and Aaron? And nobody knows. So my approach is make it all three. Even though the people were wrong and they're whining and complaining, even though Moses and Aaron were wrong in the striking of the rock, and even though the waters are never wrong, they obeyed, they did what God wanted them to do. God is still set apart in all of these events. And I know that God is so holy, He is the most holy of all, that even when we don't set Him apart, He's still holy, He's still set apart. And so I rejoice in knowing that even when I goof and when you goof, God is still God and God will use it. And uh, so I'm going to trust he does the same thing here. Well, let's race on to the finish because this last part is so extremely important. So let's go right on to chapter 21. You know, chapter 21 has the fiery serpents and here's another thing that makes no logical sense. These fiery serpents, these poisonous serpents come into the camp uh, because the people invited them to. Now, no, they didn't say, God, please send poison serpents to bite us. But here's one of the things in the wilderness you need to learn. If poison serpents come into the camp and bite the people, it's because their behavior was such that poison serpents was the exactly perfect solution to their bad behavior. If the ground opens up and swallows Korah and his 250 cohorts, it's because that's what they invited God to do. The perfect solution to their bad behavior and to the bad influence they were modeling to Israel, that was the exact thing, the perfect thing that needed to happen. And in my life, when I begin to experience some painful consequences and painful things in my life, 
I've come to realize that those painful things are what I've invited into my life because they're the exact perfect remedy for my bad behavior or by, for something in my character that needs to be fixed. Because God's my Father, He loves me as a son, He's going to discipline, discipline me so that the wilderness has its perfect work and it will change and renew my mind and make me one who's ready to move into a place of fruitfulness and victory with Him. The sages say that uh, for a person to, if a person's being beaten by somebody, that person's beating them with a stick, they said asking that person not to beat them is like asking the stick not to beat them. Whatever consequences you're coming in your life that you don't like, God is the one wielding the stick. And so um, accept it from Him. Accept it from Him and recognize He does all things well. He's got purpose in it. So we're going to take five more minutes and we're going to finish up. At the end of chapter 22, we have the battle with Sihon and Og. In verse 21, it says, Israel sent emissaries to Sihon, king of the Amorites, saying, Let me pass through your land. We shall not turn off the field and so on. But anyways, verse 23, Sihon did not permit Israel to pass through the border. And Sihon assembled his entire people and went out against Israel to the wilderness. He arrived at Yahath and waged war against Israel. Israel smote him with the edge of the sword and took possession of his land from Arnon to Yavik to the children of Ammon. For the border of the children of Ammon was powerful. Israel took all their cities, and Israel settled in all the Amorite cities, in Heshbon and all its suburbs. For Heshbon, it was the city of Sihon, Og of the Amorites. And he had warred against the first king of Moab and took all his land from his control until Arnon. <coughs> Regarding this, the poet, it goes on. And then you get down to verse 33, and uh, they turned ascended by way of Bashan. Og, king of Bashan, went out against them, he and his entire people, to do battle at Edre. Adonai said to Moses, Do not fear him, for into your hand have I given him, his entire people and his land. You shall do to him as you did to Sihon, king of the Amorites, who dwells in Heshbon. They smote him his sons and all his people until there was no survivor left of him and they took possession of his land. The children of Israel journeyed and camped in the plains of Moab on the bank of the Jordan opposite Jericho. This battle with Sihon and Og is something that's referenced uh, in many books of the Bible. And David even wrote a psalm about it in Psalm 135 verse 8. He smote the firstborn of Egypt, both of man and beast. He sent signs and wonders into your midst, O Egypt, upon Pharaoh and all his servants. He smote many nations and slew mighty kings, Sihon, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan, and all the kingdoms of Canaan. And he gave their land as a heritage, a heritage to Israel as people. The reason I bring this up is because the victory over Sihon and Og was a huge, huge thing in Israel's history. And even though there were other battles against the Amalekites and the Hittites and Jebusites and all these others, it's the victory over Egypt when God did battle and the victory over Sihon and Og when Israel did battle and of course God delivered them into their hand. These are the big battles, the huge battles. But this is one of those passages you kind of read through and think, well, this is boring and it's all these Hebrew names. Let's get on to something more interesting. So let's see if we can make it a little more interesting for you. Because this is what this, this passage, this, this portion of the Torah is all about. Here's a map of Israel. And um, this is the Sea of Galilee up here. You have the Jordan River, which runs due south into the Dead Sea. So you've got Israel over on the west. But over here in this area, this is where the Amorites lived who were ruled by Sihon, their Sihon's name. And up here in the Bashan, these are also Amorites. The Amorite people were ruled by two different kings. One king, King Og, up in the north 
ruled in the Bashan, and Sihon ruled the Amorites in the south. And the Amorites were the guardians of Canaan. So anybody who was going to come into Canaan from the east had to get through Sihon and or Og. Now the important lesson for us here is this. If you want to move from the wilderness into the promised land, you and I also have to battle Sihon and Og. There's no getting around it. The only way to get out of the wilderness is to go through the wilderness, and the path through the wilderness passes directly through the kingdoms of Sihon and Og. If we know what these two kings represent, then we know what we're battling. We'll know what we're up against. And if you defeat them for all of eternity, what you've accomplished will be something that's praised. So let's understand what these names mean. Sihon means to sweep away. It means to sweep something away before you, just to clear the path in front of you. Amorites comes from the word amor, which means to talk. These are the talkers. Amorites are talkers. Yahats, we saw that word there, that place. It means trodden down. It's trodden underfoot. In other words, this is a place where a lot of people walk. And uh, the, the ground's very compressed, yahats. Cheshban comes from the word kashav. The word kashav means to think. So, keshban means thinking, reasoning. So, let's, um, let's take a look at just these four. We have talkers. We have a place where a lot of people congregate. in your huts. It's all trodden down. This is a place of thinking and reasoning. And they sweep away everything in front of them. This is a picture of the world system and the way the world thinks. And you know, if you watch the news at all, it's really uh, disturbing to see how the world is thinking. And way they're thinking is foolish. It's unrighteous. It's abominable, the things that they're thinking. But it becomes very common. It becomes the place where everybody's walking, everybody's talking about it, Everybody's thinking about it, and they sweep away anyone who disagrees. They, um, they want to cancel you if you speak out against it. If you speak the truth, you're canceled. You're swept out of the way. But there are three other places also mentioned in verse 28. There's R, which means awakening. You know, when people began to turn from the Word of God and... Um, uh, it was called the Great Awakening. It was, it was, uh, there was a Great Awakening that was a revival, but the, this awakening, this, this awakening of conscience where we began to get enlightened and uh, wake up from all this faith stuff and supernatural, superstitious God stuff. Now, Moab means from father. Moab was the son of Lot. Remember Lot? Leaving Sodom and Gomorrah, the angels take him out. They say, now you go right over there to that city. Ah, that's too far. Can I just go over here instead? He was always reasoning, always thinking, always had a plan B. He didn't want to follow God. So he said, okay, go over there. But then he doesn't go there. He goes up to a mountain into a cave. And if you know the story, his, um, his two daughters get him drunk. And one night, one sleeps with him. The other night, the other sleeps with him. And the one has a son from her own father, so she names him Moab, which means from father. Everything about Moab is a picture of what happens when we do things our way instead of God's way. And then the other was child was Ammon, which means my people, something to that effect. So Moab from father, this is Lot's son. So just remember, Lot's son, was a, he was a hot mess, and he caused all kinds of problems, as we'll see soon in Numbers. And, uh, but he was, Moab was the result of human reasoning, of Lot's human reasoning and his daughter's human reasoning. But boy, was it disobedient. It was horrible. 
And then arnon is as a noise, it's the noise of like a river running, it's like a burbling or, or just noisy. All of these things about Sihon have to do with human reasoning, human thinking, with cheshban. But then we come to Og, who is a giant. The name Og means round. It's also a word for cake, which is round. Who doesn't like cake? Round, no sharp edges, soft cake. Bashan actually means soft. It's a word for sandy soil, which is always comfortable under your feet. You fall down, you don't get hurt, it's soft. Edre means good pasture. Good pasture. And when we do get a little information about Og, this is what it is. It's in Deuteronomy 3.11. Get this. For only Og, king of Bashan, was left of the remnant of the Rephaim. Behold, and how does it describe his size? By describing his bed. Where you stretch out, where you lie down, where you get some sleep. His bedstead was an iron bedstead. It is in Rabbah of the sons of Ammon. Its length was nine cubits. That's about, what, uh, nine... About 13 and a half feet, and it's width four cubits. That's about six feet wide by ordinary cubit. So how's Bashan described? How's his size? By the size of his bed. Og means round, means cake. Soft, sandy soil is what Bashan means. Good pasture, big bed. Everything about, about Og is about comfort. It's addiction to ease and comfort. And these are our two enemies. No one enters the land of promise without defeating these two enemies. And I know, speaking from experience, they're my two greatest enemies. Human reasoning instead of faith in God. An addiction to comfort instead of getting off my tuchus and doing what needs to be done. If we can defeat these two enemies, the promised land is ours. But we can't defeat them until God deals with us in, in the wilderness. He has to renew our minds. He has to change our minds. We have to come to the place where we trust Him and we love Him more than we love Egypt. We love Him more than we're afraid of enemies. We love Him to the point we know we can trust Him and we'll follow Him. And we love Him more than we love our own lives. May God give us hearts like Joshua and Caleb. And, um, and when we love him in that way, when we know him, then we're equipped to defeat our own human reasoning, which is the biggest enemy of faith there is, and to break this addiction to comfort. And this is especially difficult here in the West, the United States, where life is so easy. And, um, but I'll tell you something. I think, and I could be wrong, but I think that for those who are born in a cushy country that's very wealthy and you have everything you need, it's at your fingertips. I think for people who are raised and live in this kind of a culture, when you still serve God anyway, I think there's a little bit greater reward because there's so much comfort we, can de we have to defeat. And for us, comfort is much more of an addiction than it is in many countries in the world. So, we need to close up. Here's some discussion questions. They're not very good. I'll tell you that right now. You'll come up with better ones. Identify ways in which the red heifer is a picture of Messiah. And there are many. So it takes some time to go through and analyze chapter 19 and see how many parallels you can find. What areas of your life are still in the wilderness? You know, it's possible, we're complicated, that part of our lives are beginning to walk in the land of Canaan. Part of our lives can still be in this disciplinary uh, place in the wilderness, and there could be some part of your life still back in Egypt in slavery. That's how complicated and big we are in our souls. So what areas of your life are still in the wilderness? And if it's appropriate, share an example with your group. Identify an area in your life where you, my, your mind, not you mind, but your mind, has genuinely changed. Not a change of decision or opinion, but an actual change in the way you think. 
Can you think of a day you used to think one way, but now you think a completely different way? Share that with your group and encourage them. How do Sihon and Og manifest in your life? And again, share an example if it's appropriate. And this might be a point where you ask some people in your, your group for, to help to pray for you and pray for them too to, to get victory over these two enemies. And this Og, remember, he is a giant. This comfort thing, whew, he's a big one. And then, what two metal animals, two animals made out of metal, are described in the Torah? This would be fun. What two metal animals are described in the Torah? What insights you discover when you compare and contrast them? So make a menorah. Put one metal animal here and the other metal, metal animal here. Can you identify what the two metal animals are? They're complete opposites of each other. And uh, you'll have some fun with this, and you're going to bring out some new insights. Then all your notes are here, passages I quoted, passages I didn't. And as you study and discuss, you might find some things there to help you. Let's close in prayer. Our Father and King, thank you for the wilderness, because it is great and awesome like you. And Lord, though we don't like the wilderness, though it's painful, though we want to go back and not even just reverse the journey, we know that's not an option. So, Father, I pray that we would learn from the mistakes of the people described in the Torah. And as Paul tells us in Corinthians, that these things happen to them as examples for us. So, Lord, may we learn from their examples and not have to make the same mistakes. Father, change our hearts, change our minds, renew our minds through your living word. And Father, prepare us and strengthen us and arm us and give us the courage and faith and the willpower to defeat human reasoning and an addiction to comfort so that, Father, we can bring glory to you and be true disciples of Messiah as we live a life of fruitfulness and of victory in the land that you have for us. Make us the people you want us to be. And use this lesson, I pray, in some small way to help us to do that. We ask it in Yeshua's name. Amen.